Hello, it's Scott Manley here. 50 years ago, in March 1970, Britain made its first successful flight of the Black Arrow rocket. This was a suborbital test flight which would eventually lead to a, the first and only orbital flight by a British-built rocket. Britain started development of large rockets in the 1950s. They had nuclear warheads and they wanted a way to deliver them that didn't involve aircraft. As much as I love the Avro Vulcan, it was very clear that ballistic missiles were the future. So there was a program called Blue Streak to develop an intermediate range ballistic missile fueled by kerosene, liquid oxygen, running on Rolls Royce built versions of S3D engines. That's the same engine that powered the Thor PGM missiles. This project proceeded for a few years, they built up boosters, they uh, tested the engines on the Isle of Wight, and in parallel they also ran a project called Black Knight, where they used a smaller rocket to test re-entry vehicles. And unfortunately the thing kind of ran over budget, and eventually they decided to put it on ice and instead buy ICBMs from the USA and put British warheads on them. But the project didn't die right away, they tried to repurpose what they had. They tried to take the booster and then use the Black Knight as the second stage. This became known as Black Prince. And if you're wondering about these names, these are called rainbow codes. They're in the format of a color followed by a noun. And they came into being after World War II because British intelligence realized that they'd been able to understand lots of information about secret German projects just by looking at the code name. And the example is a project called Wotan. Wotan was a one-eyed god and somebody had the bright idea that this was a navigation system that used a single radio beam. So Black Prince was seen as a way to reuse existing development work on something new that might have a use. And yeah, it was known as Black Prince, but it was also known as the Blue Streak Satellite Launch Vehicle. And on paper, it would have been able to put about one ton of spacecraft into low Earth orbit. The first stage was the Blue Streak booster, uh, using kerosene and liquid oxygen as a fuel in those uh, Rolls-Royce engines. The second and the third stages were based on the Black Knight, and those were powered by the Armstrong Siddeley Gamma engines. It sounds very British, doesn't it? it those ran on high test peroxide and kerosene. And actually, by the time that Black Prince was in the offing, they had already flown 25 flights with this all successfully. Blue Streak, on the other hand, hadn't flown up to that point. So unfortunately, Black Prince, while it seemed like a good idea, nobody wanted to actually support it and put money into it. Eventually, what happened was Britain joined a European launch collaboration to create the Europa rocket, and Blue Streak was assigned as the first stage of this with a French-built second stage and a German-built third stage. And that was when we actually got some flights of the Blue Streak, and it was Far, by far the most reliable part of that entire combination. But Britain eventually, you know, lost patience, got bored, I don't know. They moved on and the French then, of course, spearheaded the Ariane launch vehicle instead, which went on to be quite successful. And so we come to the Black Arrow program. This was originally authorised in 1964, so it happened in parallel with Europa. And one interesting uh, decision in the design was that the first stage, the dimensions were specified in metric because they considered that the first stage of the Black Arrow could be part of this European launch system. However, the second and third stages, they were still specified in Imperial units. Compared to Blue Streak and Black Prince, Black Arrow was a lot smaller, a lot less ambitious. It was going to, in theory, be able to put something like 100 kilograms into low Earth orbit. The first stage was going to be powered by an eight-chamber version of the Gamma. The second stage was going to have a two-chamber version. And the third stage was going to use a single spin-stabilized waxwing rocket, a solid rocket. The whole stack was about 13 meters tall, which makes it not much bigger than the Astro rocket that we were hoping would launch earlier this week. In terms of launch mass, it was about uh, 18 tons as well. So that's more, that's about twice the mass of that Astro vehicle. This is definitely a small sat launch vehicle. So let's talk about that fuel choice, high test peroxide and kerosene. Not seen really outside of the British rocket program. So 
what you do with this is you take the peroxide, which is 80, sorry, 85% hydrogen peroxide, 15% water. You pass it over a heated catalyst where it decomposes into water or steam and oxygen. And then that oxygen reacts with the kerosene and you burn it. So you end up with an exhaust which is mostly hot steam and uh, a small amount of carbon dioxide, relatively speaking. Now, decomposing the peroxide and burning it with the kerosene produces a lot lower temperatures than you get from burning kerosene with liquid oxygen. But the exhaust makeup has a lot more water in it. And if, as you probably know, the lower the molecular mass of your exhaust, the better your specific impulse you get. So although it has lower temperature, it also has lower, specific, uh, lower molecular mass. Therefore, it, the specific impulse isn't quite that bad. In fact, the specific impulse is about 278, whereas for comparison, your typical uh, kerosene liquid oxygen rocket will have maybe 300, 320 even. But this fuel combination is also very dense in terms of its volumetric impulse, right? That means the amount of thrust you're going to get from a cubic meter or whatever specific volume of the, the, the propellant. Uh, it, if you look at kerosene and liquid oxygen, you have to have 2.3 times the amount of mass of uh, oxygen compared to the kerosene. Kerosene is a lower density fuel. Its density is about 0.8 kilograms per uh, liter, whereas liquid oxygen has a density of about 1.14. So having more liquid oxygen is good because that's denser. But with peroxide, the density is 1.44, so it's even denser than liquid oxygen. And the oxidizer to fuel ratio is up about eight. So you have eight times the mass of your propellant is in this peroxide, which is denser. And it turns out that if you're looking for the impulse per unit volume, then peroxide kerosene totally wins over you know kerosene and liquid oxygen. So having a higher density is useful because it means you can actually build a smaller rocket and it also helps because if you've got a smaller rocket then your aerodynamic drag is lower. So there's all these factors that are always a trade-off and of course hydrogen and oxygen is the rocket fuel which gives you the best specific impulse but it's obviously very very low density. The other advantage of kerosene uh, peroxide is that it is a room temperature fuel. It doesn't need any cryogenic uh, storage or anything. You don't need to worry about that. It does have the problem that peroxide does tend to decompose over time into water and oxygen. And yeah, if you spill it, it can actually cause things to catch fire, which can be really nasty. But on the other hand, it will eventually evaporate safely. The propellant combination also offered a technical advantage that other engines at the time couldn't match. So to power the turbo pumps, most of the engines at the time used yeah, gas generators. They would take a small part of their propellant, burn it off and exhaust that at low pressure. So they lost a little bit of performance. With the gamma engine, they could actually take the peroxide, run that over catalysts and use the steam generated to power the pumps. And then the steam and the oxygen that came out could go through the engine bell. So they created a staged combustion cycle, a closed cycle engine, because they were able to run the pre-burner by decomposing one of the propellants. So while the performance of the fuel doesn't look that great to start with, it actually turns out to be pretty great when you start to take all these advantages into account. So the Black Arrow rockets were manufactured in Britain and then they were transported to Australia uh, to be tested and launched at the Woomera rocket range. So they would launch the first stage, again, it was a two meter wide stage, 6.9 meters long. That would burn for 127 seconds propelled by eight gamma engines. The gamma engines would be arranged in four gimballing pairs. So they would have roll and pitch and yaw control. Then after that, there would be a stage separation. There would be some uh, stage separation motors and the second stage would ignite. Now, the second stage was uh, nine foot, six inches long and four feet, six inches wide. As I said, different units for different stages. That would burn for another two minutes, getting them most of the way up to orbital velocity. And for the final stage, they would separate the upper stage and then it would spin up using small motors so that it was spinning three times per second. Then the wax wing solid rocket motor stage would burn and inject it into an orbit and that would uh, take about 55 seconds to do that. 
So the first test launch of Black Arrow was in June of 1969. It was going to be a suborbital launch with a boilerplate uh, test payload. However, there was some problems with the control system and the vehicle was already oscillating out of control even before it cleared the launch pad. About a minute into flight, its uh, deviations from went so far that the spacecraft was uh, spinning out of control and was destroyed by range safety. And as I said, the first successful launch, a suborbital test, was 50 years ago, pretty much today, 4th of March, 1970. That was successful, so they thought they moved on to an actual real payload. This was going to be the Orba satellite, which was scheduled for launch in September of 1970. However, the spacecraft sprung a leak, and they started to lose pressure in the second stage oxidizer system. So the second stage cut out uh, several seconds early, and that meant that the final stage didn't deliver enough velocity to put the payload into orbit and it re-entered um, you know, before it completed a single orbit. The fourth launch would be in October of 1971, carrying the Prospero satellite. This was a success. It put the spacecraft into an orbit and the Prospero spacecraft is still in orbit as of today. However, that launch was uh, occurred under the with the understanding that the project was actually being cancelled already. And so this was an interesting, rare, unique moment in rocket history because I think Britain is the only country to have actually developed and flown a rocket into orbit of its own design and then decided that they didn't want to do that anymore. And you know, if you ask me, I think that was the wrong decision. Then again, I am biased. I really like rockets. I, I may not be the best person to ask. However, 50 years on, we might actually see a British-built launch vehicle, or maybe a Scottish-built launch vehicle, depending upon your particular national persuasion. Uh, Orbex is one example. They're building a small sat launcher called Prime, which should be able to put about 150 uh, kilograms into low Earth orbit and potentially do this from a Scottish spaceport in the north of Scotland. And if they make that work, that will be a major first because while there have been many European long rockets launched to orbit, there has never been a European rocket launched from Europe to orbit. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Thank you.